Can I be present if I fight against my ego? Well, first of all, as, as I speak about frequently in here, I'm not in favor of using words like fighting when we're talking about aspects of ourself. For some people, it works. I'm not against it if it works for you. For me, it doesn't work. For me, the idea of doing battle with a part of myself while the ultimate goal is expansion, doesn't, it doesn't fit together. The battle feels like I've gone from an us versus them outside to an us versus them inside. And that we've taken that which I'm trying to get over in the outside world and have simply recreated it on the inside world. That being said, if the idea of fighting your ego works for you, and no problem. But I wouldn't suggest it. If you're, if you're embarking on this path, my suggestion would be to think about terms and ways and visions that don't imply such violence against the self, that don't imply that a part of yourself is bad, or wrong, or evil, or in need of annihilation. It's all us. And it's all there for a reason. Even the parts of ourselves that we would love to change, the parts that we're working to change, well, it's all there for a reason. You didn't come out of the womb drug addicted. You didn't come out of the womb angry. You didn't come out of the womb violent. You didn't come out of the womb jealous or competitive or judgmental. It, it arose due to various situations in our life, due to things that happened, relationships we had, circumstances we were in, things we learned either formally in school or informally in our family of origin or our neighborhood or our culture. All of that which we refer in psychology to as defense mechanisms, well, they're there for a reason. They were there to defend you, the young, helpless, vulnerable you, against situations, people, feelings, circumstances, fear, assault, whatever it was. And so the ego developed to serve you. It now, in much of its manifestations, doesn't serve us so well. But it's not about fighting it. It's rather about seeing it for what it is. See, the power of the ego, it's not the ego itself that's such a problem. The problem comes when the ego runs the show. The ego simply coexisting is just slightly annoying. It's not a massive problem. It's like you're sitting on a plane or you're sitting in a room, you're sitting somewhere, a plane works because you're kind of stuck there, and you're trying to sleep or read or meditate, and a few rows back, there's a kid who just won't shut up. Okay, now it's not the end of the world. You don't want to annihilate the child yeah, you wish that the child could, you know, go to sleep or watch a movie or something. But it's, it's really just slightly annoying. And that's, that's what the ego is when it's not running the show. The time when the ego becomes such a problem is when we literally hand over our life 
to it, whether it's our mental life or our physical life. If we hand over our thoughts to the ego, okay, ego friend, here's my mind. Do with it what you will. Here are my thoughts. Do with them what you will. Well, the ego is going to take your thoughts and take your mind and run amok. And you're going to find yourself, it would be like if you got on a bus or a train or in a car or in an airplane with someone who was bordering on crazy behind the steering wheel, someone who had no concept of a destination, whose only job, only job, was to keep you in this state of separation from the world, to keep you in a state of limbo. It would literally fly you or drive you in circles. So we would never consciously, purposely, willingly give over our bodies to that. We'd never say, yeah, sure, I'll sit in your plane, fly me around in circles. Sure, I'll sit in your car, just, you know... You have no idea where we're going. I have no idea where we're going. You're crazy behind the steering wheel, but sure, no problem. I'll get in. Most of us wouldn't do that. When we hand over our minds and our thoughts to our egos, it's it's that. It's saying, run away with me. Okay, today you're going to take me into massive amounts of painful jealousy. Tomorrow, you're going to take me into anger and rage. And the day after, you know, you'll take me into despair and regret and worthlessness. Well, who wants, who wants to go there? That's why we don't, we don't hand it over to the ego. But again, you don't have to annihilate it. You don't have to fight it. What I have found very, very personally in my life and also in listening to and reading and speaking to a lot of other people um, is if you simply can look at the ego, see it, call it for what it is, understand it even, have compassion and gratitude for it, for the way that it has served you and even continues to serve you in some ways. As we move through the world in our jobs, in our roles, there's times that having an ego upon whom you can call is actually handy. You just don't want to let it run the show. And so we're not fighting. We're simply seeing. And when you see, this is also what's really interesting about the ego. When you see, a lot of it, a lot of it dissipates. There's, there's not much power behind it. It just wants to be seen. That's actually what, that, that is, the, is the ultimate goal of the ego, is simply to exist to exist, and as we start talking about annihilating it, you know, I mean, if anybody has a, has a, a dog, you know, you, you could be talking on the phone about going to see the VET, and the dog knows. And suddenly, I mean, like, you, haven't, you haven't brought out the carrier box, you haven't done anything, but somehow the dog now is running around and hiding and trying to get outside and not to go to the vet. Well, when we start talking about annihilating our egos, fighting our egos, doing battle in our egos, a very similar thing starts happening is it's like the ego starts to to get even more disobedient, even more unruly, because it knows that it now is going to have to defend its very presence. And if you can just give it a moment, yeah, okay, what do you have to say here? No, I'm not going to let you run the show. No, I'm not going to get in your car or plane or bus. But I'm perfectly happy to listen to what you have to say. I'm perfectly happy to 
give you a moment? I'm not going to let you tell me the same stories over and over again, but should you have something new and interesting to say, I'm here. When I was, when I was in college, I spent a couple of summers working at day camp. And I had a, a group of four and five-year-olds, which I just, I loved. And one of the little boys in my group, one of the youngest, if I, you know, I had 20 or 25 or 30 or however many kids there were in the group. And one of the little boys just craved attention. And if I was ever doing anything else or not looking at him, he would say, you know what, 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 until, until I would turn around. And then I would say, what, what? And he would just keep saying, you know what? You know what? And I, I mean, it was nothing. There was nothing. It was just, look at me. Look at me. You know what? You know what? I've, like, I've got something. I'm going to, you know what? You know what? And, and it just became this, this signal of, his name was Benji. It was, okay, Benji. So, yes, yes, yes. You know what? Okay. And, and, and then he was good. It was just, look at me. Just acknowledge my existence. And this is really what, what the ego wants. And so instead of thinking about fighting it, think about it like a small child. You've got the ego going, you know what, you know what, you know what, you know what, you know what? And just have a moment. All right, yes, ego, I see you, okay. So you want to chant jealousy today? You want to chant anger today? I'm not going to go there. But I'll look at you. I'll acknowledge you. I'll smile at you. I won't talk about annihilating you. But no, you don't get to run this show. And so circling back to the specific question about can we be present while we're fighting our egos? Well, yes, in fact, you have to be. You have to be, because otherwise you don't know it's the ego. Otherwise, it's just jealousy. Otherwise, it's just frustration. Otherwise, it's just anger. Otherwise, it's just greed. Otherwise, it's all of that stuff. Otherwise, it's just worthlessness. Because the ego is an incredible storyteller. That's what the ego does. It weaves, it weaves stories. It really is the, you know what, you know what, you know what? Bet you didn't know it, but those people are all over there, you know, plotting against you. And But you know what? Um, you know, you're the, the ugliest person in the room. You're the stupidest person in the room. This is the stories that the ego tells. But if we're not able to look at it and to see this very young storyteller shouting at the top of its lungs, then all there is is the story. And all there is is being plotted against, being the ugliest person in the room, being the stupidest person in the room, being worthless. Whatever stories our own mind may tell us. We each have, you know, different favorite ones. Anybody with kids know that kids tend to have a few of their favorite stories that they want you to keep going back to. They may, may permit you to read new ones every once in a while, but then they always want you to go back to the same ones. Read that one again, Mom. And again, the ego's, the ego's like that. You may get a new story every once in a while, but, but usually they're all, they're all the same theme. And they vary from person to person, but if you listen to your stories, you'll start to learn your theme. Ah, my theme is worthlessness. My theme is being left behind. My theme is being plotted against. My theme is being the, you know, unworthy one. Whatever it may be. My theme is being the victim. No matter what happens, it's all about me. I'm the victim. Whatever our story pattern may be, our story theme may be, you have to be present or you have no idea that that's what's going on. Then it just is the story. Only by being present are you able to say, ah, yes, Benji, I see you. You want to tell me a story? And then, of course, as you're staring at it, there is no story. 
There's only a story while your back is turned. But the minute you're able to turn and really face it, it dissipates. You know, my favorite analogy of that is, is the Wizard of Oz, who everyone thought was this big, great, powerful, towering wizard behind a curtain. And it wasn't until the curtain got pulled back that they and we came to know, ah, the wizard is actually just this tiny little man with a big projector. And that's, that's what a lot of our inner stuff is about. Whether you call it ego, whether you call it your inner darkness, you know, whatever word we may use for that stuff inside of us, those parts of us that feel so dark, feel so scary, make us feel so unworthy. They project themselves on our consciousness like that is who we are. But they're only able to do that until we have the courage to turn around and look at them. At which point you realize, ah, behind that screen is not this huge darkness, is not that huge being of worthlessness, but is actually a very little ego, self, lowercase s self, who's got a big projector and a script that someone else wrote. You know, it's like these, these new Facebook albums where you can have lots of contributors, right? So, you know, it's not just, not just one person who's written the script. Lots of people have written it. Some of it's been added by parents, some have been added by teachers, some have been added by relationships we had, some by our own karmic package and how we interpret the world around us, some by the culture we grew up in. But the ego's just sitting behind this screen reading a script with a big projector and a, what are they called? I'm sorry, megaphone, yes, exactly, exactly, with a big megaphone the non-electric type of booming. But if you, don't, if you don't look at it, if you're not present with it, then it feels like it is who you are. So you have to be present. But think about presence rather than thinking about fighting. Because when you're present with it really, the fighting will be much less necessary.